Здравствуйте, дорогие подписчики канала Бурят Монгол Архитен. Сегодня в рубрике «Разговоры по пятницам» Casual Fridays я беседую с Саран Цицек Леру. Ее предки эмигрировали из Иркутской области, этнической Бурятии, во времена между Первой и Второй мировой войной в США через Восточную Европу. В то время нельзя было эмигрировать из Азии, поэтому им приходилось выдавать себя за беженцев из Европы. Саран Цицек сохранила очень тесную, очень сильную духовную связь со своей прародиной. Она изучает каллиграфию, монгольский язык, шьет бурятские костюмы. Это очень интересный человек. Я надеюсь, вам будет интересно послушать это интервью. Сарка, я хотела поговорить с вами о нашей бурятской идентичности сегодня. Somehow, very beautifully managed to uh, to keep your connection with Buryat culture and background, because you know I am like a hundred percent Buryat girl and have lived most of my life in Buryatia, but I don't know as much as you do <laughs> about some of the traditions and the religions and all of our heritage. It's kind of a phenomena sometimes with uh, people with a mixed background, like living in another country that I think because, because you don't you know. have the security of knowing like this is my sole identity, uh, you probably spend more time looking into it and researching and trying to build something. Um, and understand more deeply because you don't get anything from your environment so you have to learn everything through doing and studying on your own so i'm like a product of society in russia mm. and all the process of russification that we went through i had a different program I, i was i was offered a different version of history and everything so it took me It took a lot, a lot of things for me to become aware of my own, uh, of my own culture. And you were free from all this propaganda and stuff. <laughs> mm. You were in a different, yeah, environment. How is it for you? <laughs> But of course, like my family still came from Russia, so yeah, kind of my family's own idea about their own background, I think, was obscured. Mm. So. Um, And the shame and the kind of downplaying every element of what was familiar was still what I grew up with. Um, mm -hmm. So traditions, food, especially anything based out of the home, it always came with some excuse of like how simple or stupid or, you know, well, this is just a tiny superstition or something like that, there was always some feeling of inferiority. Um, mm -hmm. So I think maybe because I'm a different generation um, and I can just simply look at my own family with love and admiration, it meant trying to undo that. Um, and study things more specifically because of course when they came here you know no one was saying that they're buryat they're just saying that they're from russia mm -hmm. uh, because in russia that was what they were forced to sort of fall into um mm -hmm. so in a way there's almost like this despite different countries there's still a parallel uh almost story That's very interesting. You're saying that you were not um, like accepted uh, because you were not quite understood because you were kind of weird because you were from Russia, but not Russian, right? Mm. <laughs> Was it so? I would say like there are cultural differences and even growing up, like being born in the United States and having that as the culture around me, um, there is still a distinct sense of yes but this is all kind of new and none of this really has anything to do with me very deeply um 
And, you know, there are certain mindsets or concepts of even what's polite or what isn't, and just a bunch of tiny differences that meant even as a kid I was kind of strange, you know? <laughs> um, but I don't know. Getting older and being able to choose where I live, I'm around at least a bunch of mostly immigrants. So we all kind of, uh, no one really minds each other's differences now. Um, yeah. yeah, that's what I thought about. That's the image I have about US. You can be anything. <laughs> it's no. a country of immigrants. <laughs> Not this so quite what, so, right? <laughs> no, this is what's projected for sure. Um, and the people who come who succeed kind of immediately and to talk about that, that they, no part of them is cut away. But of course, if you're coming here with less money, if you're coming here from, you know, a difficult situation, there is a very strong sense of having to conform to sort of mainstream culture. So people may like tiny things from different cultures, like, uh, a little bit of art here or there, or maybe an interesting dish or something like that. But even like in my mom and my grandmother's generation, like there was no real acceptance of anything other than white American culture. Um, um, even only now, I think most people approach culture as an aesthetic and not as some actual real part of life. Mm -hmm. But it could have been different if Russia had a real representation and at least people in the US would have known that Russia is not only Matryoshkas and all the other <laughs> Russian, <laughs> Russian attributes, but at least they would have known that there are what, several Asian peoples uh, group, groups living in Russia. Even now, other Asian people in the United States aren't aware of this. Um, yeah. It should be kind of common knowledge. It should even just be basic logic, right? Looking at the map itself and saying, Yeah, hey, it's a huge country. <laughs> it's a huge country. And, you know, more than half of it is technically in what we would call Asia. So maybe we would put this together. But there's almost this idea of similar to almost Native Americans that people think that the land was just empty or something. Um, and then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. the white mm -hmm. Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, and even when you get into Buryad or Mongolian history or identity, I mean, it is isn't uncommon for history teachers to tell kids here, like after the Mongol empire was over, then Mongols are just done. Like they aren't there anymore or something. Like, it's a very strange uh, fairy tale almost, you know? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's a faraway country. And, uh, you know, the same happened to me when I came to Mexico. Like, I was shocked how ignorant I was. Ignorant I was also about this country because I was surprised to me like Maya civilization was something like something that disappeared long time ago. Mm -hmm. And I was quite surprised that there are millions of <laughs> millions of Maya people still living on their lands and their language is well preserved and everything. So yeah, they it just is. they didn't it's disappear crazy. anywhere. <laughs> No, people don't just evaporate, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> but they do from people's minds. And then we kind mm -hmm. of don't really, I don't know, we don't think about it. Uh, we don't have a global consciousness. Yeah. So you are following the news of what's going on in Buryat. Of course. Now, with the, with, since the war started, so uh, what was your reaction to everything? My first thought was um, when the war started, 
it was kind of around the time I was reading very deeply into history. Um, and I think what stunned me the most was what I was reading about what happened with my family, you know, years and years ago and the reasons why they left. It was almost like a moment of history re repeating itself uh, almost perfectly. Um, and this bizarre sense of, you know, has time even moved? Uh, has anything changed, really? You would think with time and with people's efforts, there would be some kind of difference. But it was stunning because before that, I didn't see a Russian identity as necessarily being at odds with a Buryat identity. Um, it kind of just seemed like that's what you've got, so that's what it is. Um, but then kind of really truly realizing the myth of kind of the same way that here in the United States, it's not just everything is accepted. There is a dominant culture of uh, realizing, realizing that in Russia, it's the same, but even more violently so. Um, for example, I didn't know that the law still favored ethnic Russians over others. Um, mm -hmm. So it was a very eye-opening moment to kind of think really no progress has been made. It's just the same story over and over and over again. I think, I think until, until the people who are leading everything get what they wish for. Um, and in a way, the tactics, uh, the mindset, there has been no change whatsoever. It's the same story. Um, but of course, you know, just a horror, a sense of horror. In a way, it's become a lot worse. It was in USSR because in US it was proclaimed. So in a, uh, on this level, it was, we had this international mentality and everything. So now it's just all gone. <laughs> I think it got better for a time, right? Like there was this wish for things to be better, but then as soon as a little bit of pressure was put on, it's as though going back a hundred years, you know, just a total, I don't know. It feels like um, something almost existential for the Russian kind of the idea of the country of Russia that you have to kind of continue, continue to hold on to hold on. these areas, continue to have one system which dominates. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's brutal uh, more than anything else. And people cannot continue to exist in this way, um, which is, of yeah. course, why you know there are things like liberation movements why wars like this are kind of highlighting even deeper and deeper issues for people um because there's such a thing as a breaking point mm -hmm. for sure for sure i don't know when it would have happened if not for the war but it, yeah, it had to happen in some way. Yes, uh, you're totally right that the main problem was this crisis of identity in general. <laughs> because we had this ideolo uh, USSR ideology, which was totally fake and um, beautiful in its theory. <laughs> People were charmed by this idea. And so it kept us together for a very long time, despite of all the horrors that we were just, you know, turning away from and try, trying not to notice. Uh, so, but now it's like, there is not clear anymore what it is to be a Russian citizen because um, they are trying to invent, you know, the values, the so-called new values and, and the, uh, everything that's about it is just horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, normal people can do not want to relate to this. No. So, yeah, for us, uh, the ethnic people, peoples of Russia, in a way, it's so much easier 
to go through, through this crisis because we have our own values and uh, you know our own foundation to hold on, to hold to. So we are just you know our reaction is just to try to revive it to re, you know reconsider it and find something that you know reinvent ourselves. Mm. Identity in general is a fiction, as mm. Yuval Harari loves to say. It's just a total fiction, but mm. it's true. So we can be whatever <laughs> we want, we decide to be. So right now it's the time to, to find a new meaning for our identities. And Terrifying to think, though, that if we can be whatever we wish to be, that these people wish to be this, you know? They've decided that this is who they would like to be, dominant. Ah, it's terrifying. Um, but I saw this like while living here, you know, with my family being from Irkutsk, where everyone was made uh, Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, very heavily. Um, I continued to go to a Russian church for a very long time. And it's interesting that I could even see in the U.S. this process of people becoming more conservative, more brutal, um, and truthfully almost scared. Um, there was some kind of fear wrapped into how people were feeling the world around them. And, you know, in a way, they kind of kept trying to get me involved in this fervor, you know, um, which was making people more conservative as well, gradually. Um, but of course, for me, like you're saying, I looked at that and I was disgusted, you know. It didn't fit my values. It didn't fit who I felt I was. It didn't fit um, my family at all. Um, my grandma was smarter than I was. She was already Buddhist at this point. Uh, she was looking at me like, why are you going to church? You know, it's kind of strange to do that anymore. But um, just knowing that, yeah, for us, there is a choice to do something different and be different people. And I think it speaks to the wish for goodness and kindness that kind of this beautiful fake ideological dream that existed in the USSR is what got people all together, right? Uh, but then you kind of wake up and realize, wow, it was a nightmare the whole time. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is that independence uh, does not mean like a total cut, you know, of any connection with Russian culture and everything good that we, all this beautiful layer that mm. was there. <laughs> it's just, you know, uh, restating our relationship, making them on equal, you know, based on equality. So, mm. and it's amazing how scared people are to become independent because, you know, all this, yes, yes, yes learned helplessness. It's just, it's just people were trained not to make any decisions on their own, you know, to depend on the center. Mm. So for, for them, it's really scary now to, you know, to take re the responsibility for their own destiny. <laughs> mm. And, and it's, and it's really crazy because, you know, the way that they're managing our republic is just horrible. It's basic, basically stealing all the natural resources and that's it. There's no, like, there is no smart governing. <laughs> so who could, I mean, any, anybody, we have so many educated people and it could, anybody could do it a lot better. But this fear has had been instilled you know, for so long, and it has like a generational memory. So it's very difficult to overcome it. And it's based on violence, right? You know, yes. a lot of people were sent to prison. A lot of people have suffered deeply for 
trying to fulfill their own destiny and be in charge of their own life uh, fully as who they are. But at the end of the day, it's sort of deciding between simply just living, uh, sort of the survival instinct, or recognizing that even this won't lead to survival. Even this is not going to ultimately make anyone safer. Safer. It's, you know, that compliance is how and why there are disproportionate numbers of people being sent uh, into the military. Um, that at the end of the day, you think I'm doing this because I'm scared that something bad will happen, but something bad is already happening. So what's the real result of that? The thing is that Russia has never been as weak <laughs> as it is right now. So this is really our probably unique chance to, you know, to, to follow the other republics that are trying to get their independence. And um, we are somewhere very far from the center, very close to our brother nation, Mongolia. So we, we are in a very, in very fortunate uh, conditions. So we must, <laughs> we, mm. we just don't have any other, yeah. We must uh, use this, uh, seize this chance. It's very nice to see the global Buryat community uniting these days. Are tr try we are really building so well the horizontal connections now with our close um, ethnic groups. And it's really beautiful to see because when while we were in Russia, we never, <laughs> we somehow we didn't have this kind of relationships without the you know mediator in the in the face of Kremlin. In the, in, so right now we are building these very strong connections and also connections with Buryats all over. Because you know Russia is trying to build this um, idea that everyone who is not in Russia right now, they're all traitors. <laughs> So they are trying to separate us. And just on social media, you know, the number of artists and various people kind of lifting one another up and kind of building also this um, indigenous peoples of Siberia kind of identity. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, like it just reflects kind of the deeper, older history anyway. Um, if anything, being broken apart is something newer uh, because there is a mediator, because there is someone kind of breaking up communities into smaller and smaller pieces. Uh, it's much easier to control that way. So I think it's nice that even on the smallest social level, you know, even just on my own social media, there are Yakut and Tatar and um, a lot of people in Republic of Mongolia that I interact with frequently. Uh, and there is a sense of something bigger and wider. Uh, and of course, wouldn't that be terrifying for the people who are currently in control? So tell me about a little bit uh, about your studies. Yeah, it, Asian studies as a major uh, for my degree, which um, I'll hopefully be finishing soon, um, mm -hmm. then moving on to something more. Um, admittedly, in the United States, you know, Asian studies means almost anything but Mongolian. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> there's really no sense of like Mongolian people anywhere. Um, so, it, it's really a heavier emphasis on like East Asian countries, uh, China, Japan, Korea, primarily, but even Southeast Asians are mentioned less, you know, which is crazy, but um, in a way, most of what I've had to study regarding my own identity has been kind of outside of any curricula. Um, 
which is sad, but um, even there, there is a sense of, you know, the only relevance being the time of the empire, and that was so long ago, so, you know, no one really thinks of that very much, but um, I feel like I usually end up being the one to educate other people uh, about it. Uh, I don't know, I'm kind of hoping that by having these studies under my experience that in the future I could maybe put a little bit more awareness on Mongolian history, Buryat history, and these identities as being real, you know, uh, and existing and should be included in what people are studying. Well, that's probably dictated by the, you know, the economics. So mm. definitely China and uh, South Korea are important, <laughs> uh, strong economic uh, states. So it's important to develop relationship with them. And Mongolia right now is not, and it's actually um, would be really great for Mongolia as well when uh, when Russia collapses, mm. and we will be, be able to build um, more sane economic relationships. Number of uh, people who have emigrated to the United States affects what's focused on quite a bit as well. I think the fact that you know in Republic of Mongolia there's like three million people and mm -hmm. Buryat people are like less than half a million. So this also kind of affects what people focus on or study because there is a sense of, you know, relevancy, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but if we're talking about culture and history and impact on the area surrounding, it's, it is relevant, you know. Um, profoundly relevant the number of times people don't really realize like oh that's an element of mongolian culture that's still existing in korea or china is surprising to me because it's so obvious almost uh you almost begin to feel crazy you know trying to tell people this new information but um at the end of the day history is not subjective it's subjective um, what happened did happen. Um, and with the economy, I think it's also sad and interesting that Mongolia lacks water and wood resources so desperately. Um, and then you look at all of the neighboring countries surrounding it that once independent could easily trade with Mongolia, automatically these issues would be resolved. Uh, Similarly, there are resources in Mongolia that are very rich that surrounding countries would also have more uh, ability to utilize. But yet again, that mediator of Russia prevents whomever is uh, being directly impacted from really being helped in any lasting way. Uh, if you stay poor, then you're staying kind of easy to manipulate. Well, Russia has been uh, a huge <laughs> influence, of course, and poor Mongolia is between, jammed between these two huge non-democratic <laughs> countries, of course. It, it's been difficult. And somehow they are still managing to have a huge growth. You know, they have lots of, they attract lots of investments. And, you know, Elon Musk is coming to Mongolia soon. Have you heard it? No, yeah, he's like he has some huge plans for Mongolia as well. So because you know it, it's it has all the uh, conditions for the for, for the growth and uh, normal trustful relationship with its partners. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the most important thing. Yes. And they have been always sending their youth abroad to get good education, so that has been always priority for them. And now it's bringing the good results. 
And we are on the opposite. <laughs> We've been only isolating ourselves and you know, closing, creating our own imaginary reality. Mm. It's been crazy. <laughs> so close, but so different. Uh, but it's a good example of even with limited resources, what could be done with actual autonomy. Yeah. So now it's a difficult, yeah, it's a difficult moment because we don't have like one united vision. But, in, you know, in a way, I really like how opinionated where people are. <laughs> I don't mind all these small different groups with their own ideas. It's, <laughs> it's also, you know, a foundation for future democracy. We're not going to build, you know, this unified, scary thing. We will always be very... <laughs> we will always articulate different opinions and visions, and we will always have this conversation, which is, I think, great. So, let's see. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, people, everyone will be able to respect and enjoy the fact that we're all stubborn and passionate um, mm -hmm. and that whatever foundation begins will be done in a good way. So that we have groups that are um, like, have a more, more focus on decolonization process. But in a way it's kind of frustrating for me to, to you know, to see that they don't quite understand that decolonization, like really real decolonization will mean independence. Mm. There is no other, it, there can be no other outcome of this no. process. No, the further you go to your own identity, the more that autonomy is required. Um, if it were possible, to remain subject, but still have a decolonial reality, then it would be so, you know? Uh, but these two things are diametrically opposed, right? Um, mm -hmm. Or at least they should be. Um, you can't really have all of it at once, um, no matter how hard you try. but. I think that's that tough thing of people not wanting to acknowledge like to decolonize means a lot of work um, and difficult, personally challenging work, not just structurally difficult, but internally difficult also. Um, and in a way, the history of what's happened can't be denied also. Um, there can be a return to deeper culture and tradition, but you can't deny what the past three to 400 years have been too. The thing with Russian history is that it's so full of horrible crimes and <laughs> horrible pages that people sometimes just feel, you know, it's just too much, you know. <laughs> Maybe we should just forget about it all but they don't understand that it's not, you cannot uh, build nothing good without, you know, accepting the, facing the real history. People want to dream again. <laughs> yeah, well, they feel overwhelmed because the Russian people themselves have suffered so much injustice. So they think, but how about us, you know, why we should, you know, only talk about these other colonized nations when we also have suffered horrible mm. crimes against the Russian people, which is true. But it's very, it's, yeah, it's very difficult job, but it has to be done. There's no other way. People are afraid of different, you know, they think that if we start digging the history, then there will be lots of hatred and everything, but they don't understand that it's the opposite. It's a process of healing, you know, we can just, you know, restore the history and then start anew. Hmm. People are 
right in a sense that studying history can make you angry and upset. Um, I am often very upset uh, studying almost any history of any country. Um, but then when it's personal, of course, you do have that moment of kind of being taken in by the anger a little bit more. Um, but this is a choice also, right? To say that studying history is just only going to result in more animosity, yet again takes away the fact that people have choices to make. Uh, you know, are you going to let the brutal moments of history create more brutal moments of history or not? Um, and I think the ultimate show of grace is to change things for the better without there being any sense of vengeance. Uh, you know, just simply letting what's good be good and moving forward well. Um, the brutality of the past is why things have to change now. So how could it be repeated and expect anything good to come later? Yes, uh, this, the history, all the horrible things that happened in the past, they will still haunt us. It's like, you know, all, in all the horror movies, there is this like scary, character that is, you know, um, uh, say, following the, you know, the hero of the, of the movie and just trying to get his attention, you know, he mm. only wants to be seen, to mm. be recognized, and then he leaves him in peace. That's what we, <laughs> we have to do with our history, you know, so mm. that we find our peace and can go on, uh, you know, with the healed personality, better mental health. Because now we, with that nation and all the other colonized nations, we are, you know, this person who is traumatized, who had uh, experienced trauma in his, you know, childhood, let's say, and is experiencing total dissociation. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> we can also have this analogy. For the, the whole nation, because that's what has really happened, and we don't even realize it. It kind of does make me think about um, in shamanism the belief that when people undergo something traumatic, you know, they lose one of their souls. Mm -hmm. And it's usually the soul associated with the ability to succeed or to kind of put your own will forward. And, you know, the solution, of course, is making offerings to ancestors. Um, and I think that this, in a way, is the same thing also. Learning the history, honoring the history, understanding deeply what happened, and then by kind of paying that respect, we're able to lay the pain down, finally and mm -hmm. gain the ability to move forward again. Yes, definitely. Yes, uh, because now the nation is really, the nation is not healthy. Mm -hmm. And uh, not healthy, divided. And um, yeah, it's, it's amazing because I had so many re revelations about the situation because I have always thought that, you know, we are so different. I mean, we, we, are, we have different religion, different language. Of course, we forgot our language, but, it, you know, we know we have our own language, <laughs> but, uh, different um, history, everything. So how can we have this solidarity with the Russian people against, mm -hmm. you know, Ukrainian people, for example? Yeah. It was such a difficult thing for me to accept because I had no idea that we had people have come to this kind of, you know, uh, loss of dignity, loss of their own understanding of what's happening. I thought it was impossible because, you know, we all look 
in the mirror, we see we are not Russians. <laughs> we are not treated as equal in this country. We are discriminated everywhere. It's not that, uh, it's not like we have a real federation. Mm. There is such a notion as one nation. There is no such thing in Russia. It's an abusive relationship. Yes. And how often, even with individuals, do you see that play out? That they defend the person who abuses them, um, you know, with their whole life. Uh, for no other reason than they don't really know how else to think. Um, and it's even this thing of like, you know, we forgot our language. Well, the language was taken. All of these things have been taken in order to create this, this kind of compliance. Um, and so while there is kind of anger and frustration about like, how could it be that people who have been so hurt by Russia would voluntarily support it so much? On the other hand, it's almost like, what else would be happening? Um, this is exactly what Russia has been working towards, is ethnic minorities self-destructing in order to protect Russia and ethnic Russians itself. Um, yeah, that's a result of colonization itself. That's, that's mm. right. Uh, also, another reason is because people don't differentiate like one private, just some private cases with the systematic problems. Of mm. course, we all have very close Russian friends. Of course, we love some some things in Russian culture, you know, literature, whatever. Of course, we some of us got married and we have mixed marriages and like we are so intertwined and we are really one nation, but within our own republic. Mm. But it, it doesn't mean that this systematic problem doesn't exist in this country. So it's people don't know how to differentiate these two things. Absolutely. I think it's so, it's, it's, that's the other tactic though, of someone who's been through some kind of brainwashing of, well, mm -hmm. I haven't seen it, so it can't be true. I haven't experienced it, so it can't be real. Um, Not all men are, you know, <laughs> like some people, uh, yeah, <laughs> deny feminism because, you know, not all men are, abusers and so on like, the and same really, problem. it's the same thing and at the end of the day it just shows the inability to have empathy um mm -hmm. and to consider you know yet again some things are just simply objective reality it isn't subjective it isn't uh only based, based on, on one's what? own experience there's a wider scope to observe and it's obvious, but anything that challenges the way we understand ourselves automatically becomes harder to accept. Um, and sometimes it's like just the best policy to think, okay, it's nothing personal, <laughs> uh, except in the ways that it does affect your life. And if you don't have those experiences, it's a sign of your luck and how good your circumstances have been. It's not a sign of, uh, I don't know. It's very self-centered, I think, to base your idea of a whole world view just on your, uh, your own life. Um, they have to inform each other, but you you know hopefully one of my favorite things personally is learning something that's bigger than my own scope um mm -hmm. and being able to have insight into other people's realities and lives and perspectives but it's very sad when that becomes something people become almost afraid of um mm -hmm. and it's in those moments that they i think are realizing 
if I accept that, then it means something would have to change for me. Um, and no one really wishes to be personally challenged in that way. Um, so that's part of why this process is as much personal as it is uh, social and governmental. For it to make any sense to people, they will have to challenge their own ideas about their own identity. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, thank you. <laughs> For the time. Yeah. Uh -huh. Bye. Bye. <laughs>